Thank you very much. Well, can you all hear me okay? Yes. Excellent. Well, thank you for your welcome. It's great to be speaking about Elgar here in Malvern in the heart of the Elgar country. I did live here for a short period in the 1980s in Worcester, where I managed uh, the SBCK bookshop, as was then, near the cathedral. And it was at the birthplace in 1986 that I joined the society. For um, nearly 30 years, I, well, more than 30 years, actually, I lived in Winchester, and for a while I chaired Southern Branch. Currently, I live in South Staffordshire, a village out called Treesle, outside Wolverhampton, and I'm a lay minister, a voluntary role in local churches. One of the churches, St John's Church Swindon, has a tenuous Elgar connection, because Dora Penny's mother, Dora Mary Heal, is buried there. As we probably know, she died shortly after Dora Bella was born. Very grateful to Richard, my partner who put the items today onto a memory stick, and for our Richard secretary for playing the excerpts. Well, the major Protestant theologian, Karl Barth, once said, for the invention of the gramophone, God cannot be thanked enough. And I agree with him. What a wonderful gift it is to have recorded music. I mean, it's not the same as experiencing music live, is it? Or playing or singing, but how one can really get to know a work and indeed listen to different performances and get different perspectives on the same piece through recordings. They have their downside, of course, because it can, it can filter, really, one's appreciation of a piece that you hear it in, the, in your mind's ear in that recording. How many people hear the cello concerto, for example, through Dupre's playing of it, whereas other people bring other qualities to the piece? So it can have its downside, but there's a, <laughs> this is very rewarding to compare recordings. It's so illuminating. People get intrigued by the title of this talk, only what might have been. Well, it, this is what it's about. Over the years, I've become aware that, not infrequently, recordings of Elgar's music have been proposed, projected, planned, but never actually happened. It's true of other major composers too. Haydn and Rachmaninoff come to mind. But Elgar is our focus today. We will explore why this is the case with some variations on the theme in good Elgarian fashion. These days, of course, the situation has vastly improved with radio broadcasts and live performances, new as well as archive, appearing on disc and commercially available, not to mention YouTube and live streaming. And sometimes we are richly compensated by the many Elgar recordings which have been made. And sometimes these give tantalising glimpses of only what might have been. To treat the subject adequately would entail more thorough research than I've been able to do. For example, investigating record company archives. What follows is what I've picked up, and I seem to be picking up more all the time. This is the third time I've done this presentation, and I've picked up quite a bit more since the last time. So it's what I've picked up magpie-like over the years, and it's wide-ranging and anecdotal. Well, any discussion of Elgar's recordings must consider the substantial body of recordings which the composer himself made from 1914 onwards. An exclusive artist with HMV, Elgar enjoyed a warm professional relationship with their executives, above all the entrepreneurial Fred Geisberg, whom Richard and Jones spoke about to this group a few months ago. Indeed, Elgar was the first great composer to extensively record his own music. A substantial number were made by the old acoustic process where a handful of players and a singer squeezed round a horn, and fascinating many of these are. But the introduction of electrical recording in about 1925 made a huge difference, enabling orchestras to be recorded adequately for the first time. And all our excerpts this afternoon are electrical recordings. 
So here's a sample from December 1928 of Elgar conducting the overture from Wonder of Youth Suite No. 1. Nervous energy, enthusiasm and the idiomatic flexibility of Elgar's conducting are infectious. One of today's finest Elgar conductors, Zachary Oromo, said of, this, said of Elgar's recorded legacy, It is most revelatory. They present a unified image of Elgar's conducting, fleet and flowing, very focused on the overall musical line, and subtle in colours, impulsive, certainly that, and elusive. That's so well put. What, though, of the significant gaps in this legacy, the works we might have expected Elgar to have recorded, but he never did? And I think there's more going on than him just not getting round to it or not living long enough to do so. Now, it's hardly surprising that the big oratorios were not set down. Gerontius had to wait until 1945 to receive a recording and complete recording, so it's hardly surprising that the Kingdom or the Apostles were not recorded by Elgar. But what, though, of the introduction and allegro for strings? Cooley received at its premiere in 1905, it used to be claimed that this amazing work was hardly played and neglected in the 1920s. But we now know, thanks to Mr Google, that it was played for quite frequently. See the fascinating Proms archive, for example. It's fair to say, though, that the introduction to Allegro wasn't seen as a major piece by Algar. It wasn't cherished or recognised at that time as the masterpiece we regard it to be today. There is no suggestion in the surviving correspondence that Elgar should conduct it for disc. Why was this? The most plausible reason is that it had been recorded by the up-and-coming John Barbaroli and his chamber orchestra for the National Gramophonic Society in 1927. Elgar was sent a copy and he thought it excellent in every way, remarking that, you, to, that Barbaroli made it a bigger work than he'd thought of it as. Even if Elgar was wittily equivocal about some details, the length of pauses for example. In fact, Barbaroli made not one but two versions of this piece in Elgar's lifetime re-recording it in 1929 and many times later. Also missing from Elgar's discography among orchestral works is the exquisite two-movement suite Dream Children. Interestingly, when it was proposed to Elgar that he record Dream Children as a fill-up to the nursery suite, he agreed in principle, but tellingly it never happened. Now there's certainly, one can make a case that Elgar was not keen on performances of dream children and there may be a devastating intensely private loss behind that music but I know this is controversial. Another work expressing personal loss is Sospiri, 
very plausibly, Elgar lamenting the death of his close friend, Julia Worthington. Another very personal piece, Elgar never committed to disc. In 1925, Compton Mackenzie of the National Gramophonic Society, which recorded mostly chamber music, approached Elgar to play the piano for a late acoustic recording of his piano quintet. Wisely, perhaps, Elgar refused. I never play the piano for him. I scramble through things orchestrally in a way that would madden with envy all existing pianists. I never really did play. I must not begin now. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> we might regret not having Elgar playing the piano quintet, but perhaps we're not missing too much. Elgar suggested instead Ethel Hobday. She was the wife of Alfred Hobday, who was the viola player in the quartet in the premiere of the introduction in Allegro. So Ethel Hobday made this late acoustic recording with the Spencer Dyke Quartet. And you can hear it today on YouTube, and very enjoyable it is too. The piano is somewhat recessed, but Ethel Hobday has a lovely, warm, pearly sound. I'd love to know what instrument she was playing. And she'd obviously, she played it, obviously to Elgar's liking, at Seven House. Lots of string slides, portamenti, and it's swift and flexible. I'm inclined to prefer that performance to one that was made at the end of Elgar's life with Harriet Cohen and the Stratton Quartet. That, that, that one hasn't had much currency on CD. Anyway, it's high time we have more music. And here is the first interlude from the Symphonic Study Falstaff in the November 1931 recording made by Elgar with the LSO at the opening of the Abbey Road Studios. Why include this? Well, Falstaff is one of the most underappreciated works by Elgar these days. I remember in 2016, I wanted to do something for the Shakespeare anniversary that year at Southern Branch. So we had a speaker came and gave us an exposition of Falstaff. And it was interesting how many experienced Elgarians there say, well, Falstaff, don't care for that. Haven't listened to it for years. But I find it an absolutely thrilling piece. With the, the, one catches these cross-references all the time. And they're in, indeed the undertow of our, of, of our sorrows and failings, as Elgar said. This recording from 1931 is arguably one of the highlights of Elgar's recorded legacy. And interestingly, the work will crop up several times later this afternoon. So we'll have the interlude from full start.
slender toned but sensitive soloist was Elgar's loyal friend Billy Reed, leader of the LSO. And there's a poignant, wistful nostalgia here that's very special. Sometimes Elgar does share the intimate secrets of his music in his recordings. Well, as early as 1917, Elgar had wanted to record The Dream of Garontius. And in 1927, the enterprising Fred Geisberg's HMV engineers took the bold step of attempting to record live performances under the composer at the Royal Albert Hall. Alas, technical problems were experienced, major ones, and the audience on a wet February afternoon in the days of the smog were decidedly bronchial. You know, what is it about concerts? If one person coughs, someone else coughs. They're like barking dogs, isn't it? <laughs> and it was like that that afternoon. And the outcome was that only four of the 78 sides were issued. Although test pressings were retained, some given to the composer, and they've turned up many years later. And here I must um, express an indebtedness to Gerald Northrop Moore, this invaluable book, if you don't know it, John Elgar on record, it gives an absolutely thorough um, research with all the correspondence of, about Elgar's recordings. It's, it's absolutely invaluable. He did invaluable work at recovering many of these test pressings too. From what survives from that Grontius performance in 1927, however, we can hear Elgar at white heat, a, a performance of urgency, drama and awe. Six months later, at the Hereford Three Choirs Festival, the engineers had another go. Cathedral authorities were less than helpful, and technical challenges were even more formidable. Also, years later, Geisberg recalled, one chatterbox of a gossip who, during an unexpected pause, continued a dissertation about a bargain in camisoles which she had picked up. I didn't know what a camisole was, I had to look it up. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, alas, the HMV committee found there were too many flaws in the sound for any of Grontius to be issued. It was a pity because Percy Hull, the organist at Hereford, he'd been very keen on those recordings, so sad. Many were destroyed, but, but some test pressings at Elgar's special requests did survive. So what we're left with today, between the two attempts, is over half of Grontius conducted by its composer. Not, though, the Demon's Chorus. There exists an old brown 78 sleeve which has Demon's Chorus pencilled on it, but no disc inside. Well, obviously, the 78, the shellac, it's broken, hasn't it? I do recall when I lived in Worcester talking to some older men who'd sung in Garontius under the composer's baton, and they recalled Elgar saying to them, Shout it, don't sing it, you're demons, not men. So it's tantalising. What would it have sounded like under Elgar? I don't know. There we are. There is also on the Hereford records an Elgar world premiere, the only one we have on disc conducted by the composer, which was, it was issued at the time. It's a very short civic fanfare composed for the entry of the civic dignitaries and runs on into the national anthem. Well, carrying on with de Grontius, the Irish tenor John McCormack was a hugely popular artist. He'd been making records since 1904, as early as that, of ballads and operatic arias. One of the wealthiest Irish men on the globe, his royalties from recordings were £92,000 in 1922. No idea how much that is in today's money, but I think it's a lot. <laughs> McCormack's first encounter with Elgar was hardly propitious. Following a performance of Verdi's Requiem in 1912, a military-looking man burst into the artist's room, fuming that this had been the worst performance he'd ever heard, <laughs> blaming the soprano. On hearing this was Sir Edward Elgar, no less, McCormack remarked, thank God his music is better than his manners. <laughs> but 20 years later, Elgar and John McCormack performed together at a benefit concert organised by a zealous Roman Catholic, wealthy socialite, Mary Anderson de Navarro. She invited both men to lunch in subsequently at her home in the Cotswolds. McCormack was nervous but agreed to come. 
He had sung Gerontius in the USA, but by this stage in his career, he'd given up big roles and performing opera. But McCormack recalled in his memoirs, I had got <laughs> see, he was singing excerpts of Gerontius with Elgar playing. He recalled, I had got little habits of my own in several places. Elgar picked me up on every one of them and insisted on his own phrases, especially Tempe. That's quite telling, isn't it? Time and again we find Elgar insistent on performers doing what he wrote, although, of course, he doesn't always do that himself on his own recordings. Uh, we, we could give instances of that later if you wanted. Elgar was nevertheless charmed by McCormack, and cl clearly still cherished the hope of Gerontius being recorded complete. And here was a star, celebrity tenor, with, <laughs> for the title role. Elgar wrote a very private letter to Fred Geisberg, tentatively suggesting that McCormack might make records of a complete Gerontius. A few days later, he received a reply from Geisberg's boss, Rex Palmer, of the Gramophone Company, saying... It would be ideal to make it complete, but it was not possible until better times. In other words, it was the financial situation, the economic depression of the 1930s, that stalled Gerontius with McCormack under the Battle of Elgar. By now, they were on good first-name terms, and Elgar wrote to Geisberg requesting that John record the song pleading with a small string ensemble, in, as solo piano does not sustain enough. McCormack was due to make some uh, records in a few days' time. Geisberg thought this an excellent idea, but alas, it never happened, only what might have been. Maybe a small ensemble, as Elgar proposed, was unrealistic or too expensive. But I don't know about you, but I can hear in my mind's ear McCormack's unique qualities in that song pleading and it's really tantalising disappointing that that record was never made. He did however record Is She Not Passing Fair? What did you think of that? Very Irish. Very <laughs> yes. Irish. <laughs> uh, our friend here, whose name I can't remember, I'm sorry. Andy. Andy. Sorry, Andy. Yes, thank you, Andy. 
It's, it says from the help of his phone that £92,000 in 1922 is worth £6,688,499.51 um, today. <laughs> <laughs> we can safely say he was a wealthy man. <laughs> He was also actually a big sponsor of the IRA, but he kept quiet about that. That's by the by. Well, McCormack is a Marmite singer. There's no doubt of his ringing tone and his endearing gifts of communication. But it's his phrasing. It's so idiosyncratic, isn't it, with these elongated vowel sounds. Nor is he quite together with the pianist. Would he have made a convincing Gerontius? I'm not sure. But when over dinner once, I mentioned this to Valerie Langfield. I don't know if you know Valerie. She has written a major book on Roger Quilter and knows more than anybody can be expected to know about singing English song. Well, Valerie sort of spluttered and thought the idea was wrong-headed and preposterous <laughs> of McCormack even thinking about recording Gerontius. As I say, he had sung it earlier in his career, though. Well... Sponsored by the British Council, the first complete Gerontius was finally recorded under Malcolm Sargent in 1945 with Hedel Nash, who'd been admired by Elgar, singing the title wrong. Carl Newton's book, The Best of Me, goes in on the edit, um, edited essays on Gerontius has a very well-researched chapter on the making of this recording. And incidentally, if you haven't got that book, nor the one of, uh, in the same series on Elgar's music, Oh My Horses, on the music of Elgar during the Great War. There are copies at the first going for absurdly cheap prices. Anyway, the question with the 1945 recording was, who should sing the angel in Grantius? And the candidates included Gladys Ripley, quite well established as a singer at that time, or the newly emerging contralto Kathleen Ferrier. Ferrier was auditioned, but the producer, Walter Legg, tried it, it was a notorious womaniser, tried it on with her in the taxi. <laughs> Ferrier was resolved. I'm certainly not going to give that bugger any solo material, as you wrote in the letter to <laughs> Isabel Bailey. There we are, Kathleen Ferrier, a forerunner of the Me Too movement. If you don't know them, Kathleen Ferrier's... <laughs> Letters are wonderfully lively and vivid. I, I can't recommend them too highly. Now, on the complete, so Gladys Ripley sings it on the complete recording, and, and I find her sympathetic and consoling. But she's not Kathleen Ferrier, is she? That very special singer who holds such a strong place in people's hearts even today. The O oh, that a live performance might turn up with Ferrier singing and conducted by her friend and mentor John Barbaroli, but here's hoping, highly unlikely we can dream on. What does survive, though, is a precious test pressing of My Work Is Done with Gerald Moore, which we'll hear now.
might ask, does it cut off at that point? Well, they, the producers would have said, that's enough, we know now. They didn't feel it was necessary for Ferrier to sing any more, the audition, tantalising. It shall peace pierce thee too, in D. Ferrier loved singing Gerontius, but her letters reveal that she didn't like sea pictures and would only sing some of them, not the whole cycle, nor the music makers, if you were wondering why we haven't got recordings of her singing in those parts. There is, of course, one other track that does survive of Ferrier singing Elgar, and that's quite a stirring uh, uh, the opening of the Free Trade Hall in Manchester after the, 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 the Second World War, where she sings Land of Hope and Glory. Thinking of Kathleen Ferrier reminds me of another much-loved lower voice singer with special gifts of heartfelt communication who died all too young in 2006, Lorraine Hunt Leverson. I'll not forget her singing of the music makers at the opening night of the proms in 2004. The plangent voice mesmerising with a rapt intensity. I puzzled why the performance has not been issued on commercial CD because there are a lot of Rain Hunt Leverson's live performances have come out. It's a wonderful recital with Peter Serkin from one of the music festivals in the States, for example. But I was absolutely thrilled to discover it on YouTube, this performance of the music makers. But it soon became clear why it's not been issued. The Rain Hunt Lim Le Leverson is drowned by the orchestra. The ensemble's pretty ragged, more so than would be generally acceptable these days. And this was from Leonard Slatkin's none too happy period with the BBC Symphony Orchestra. Well, back to Gerontius. There are other might have been recordings. I'm told that Walter Legg wanted to record it in stereo with his magnificent Philharmonia chorus and with the great German mezzo Christa Ludwig and Dietrich Fischer Dieskau. I'm not sure who would have sung Gerontius. But I've been unable to discover anything about that project. If anybody knows, please, please tell me. In the mid-70s, the prospect was raised of CBS making a recording of Gerontius with Placido Domingo, Janet Baker and Dietrich fischer dieskau to be conducted by Daniel Barenboim. This didn't happen either. I wonder why that was. Could be financial or, as I strongly suspect, could be getting a slot in a busy artist schedule. It took six and a half years for sessions to be arranged to, for Janet Baker and Daniel Barenboim to make a single disc of Schumann Leader. So if you, if you put together these other very busy, busy high-profile artists, the thought of getting them all together in the same room to make a recording was probably just too much. For a Berlin performance of Grontius, which Decker recorded live in 2016 under Barenboim, the thrilling occasion, I understand, from people who were there. Jonas Kaufman, no less, was booked to sing the title role. He pulled out at the 11th hour to be replaced by Andrew Staples, who can be heard on the subsequently issued recording. I wonder if Kaufman, surely the most celebrated tenor performing today, will ever sing Gerontius. If he does, it could make new friends for the composer, given his global popularity. Though... Let it be whispered, I don't think the voice is what it was. <coughs> During the mid-1970s, Gerald Northrop Moore was in Sir Adrian Bolt's office above the Wigmore Hall in London. The phone rang. It was Christopher Bishop who produced Bolt's EMI recordings about the forthcoming recording of Gerontius. Who did Sir Adrian want to sing the title role? Bolt asked... Gerald Northrop Moore, who unhesitatingly said, John Vickers. <laughs> Bolt put that to Christopher Bishop, who <laughs> said, in no uncertain terms, that wouldn't be possible. Vickers was too expensive, and nor was he an easy man to work with. Anyway, Nikolai Geber sings it on Sir Adrian's recording. At this stage in his career, John Vickers, the Canadian tenor, was a Helwyn tenor, specialising in big roles like Verdi's Otello, and Britain's Peter Grimes. Good credentials for Gerontius, one would have thought. Happily, however, <coughs> we do have a recording of the Canadian tenor as Gerontius caught much earlier. It's a live performance in Rome conducted by 
John Barbroni in 1957. And we will hear Take Me Away. Isn't that terrific? Yeah. Okay, he ins Vickers inserts rests where he shouldn't. What searing conviction, how he flings the words. I have to say on that recording, the Italian chorus leave a good deal to be desired. Mm -hmm. And whilst value that recording for um, Vickers, I much prefer this <coughs> live Barbaroli one from New York, which song I've just brought out, beautifully remastered by Lanny Spar, who in his sterling work, really recommend this as Richard Lewis in superb voice and the wonderful Canadian contralto Maureen Forrester. It's gripping in its intensity, that one. Well, time forbids us to look too much into the Apostles and the Kingdom, but we can um, talk about them afterwards if you like. So from Grantius, we turn to Elgar's vast and intimate violin concerto. Now, of all the Elgar recordings that might have been, Nothing is more often than lamented than the absence of the violin concerto from Fritz Kreisler, dedicatee and first performer of the work with the composer. 
and conducting. One of the most distinctive players of his, of his own, or any subsequent generation, Chrysler revolutionised violin playing. He deployed a highly individual technique, playing with the middle of the bow and a continuous vibrato of sound. And the result was unique, uh, having an appealing, almost vocal style. And it's still studied with, re rewardingly, by violinists today. Chrysler was a great admirer of Elgar's music. In 1905, he called Elgar the greatest living composer and saw him as heir to Beethoven and Brahms. Chrysler premiered the Elgar's concerto at the Three Choirs in 1910. With the advent of electrical recording in 1925, Fred Geisberg was intent to record the work with Chrysler and Elgar conducting. Surviving correspondence reveals that Geisberg, not a man to give up, repeatedly approaching the celebrated violinists who seemed to accept the idea, but for reasons less obvious, alas, it never happened. In 1929, Elgar was willing, in principle, to travel to Berlin and conduct a symphony orchestra with Chrysler playing. Um, Elgar had very limited German, and the concerto would have been unfamiliar to the orchestra. Anyway, that was not to be. It didn't happen. The correspondence doesn't tell us why. That there's no recording of the violin concerto with Chrysler and Elgar is, of course, regrettable, but it's also, it is understandable. There's evidence that Chrysler found Elgar a difficult conductor to work with. Would he have been more open to do it, one wonders, if it had been suggested with the young John Barbaroli or Sir Landon Ronald? And after the Great War, like so many, Elgar's music suffered, didn't it, in Germany and Austria, having been championed in those German-speaking countries before 1914, and it went so out of fashion after 1918. Clark Chrysler did play the work occasionally, it was very occasional, less frequently, and when he did so, he was making cuts. David Bicknell, the sympathetic, albeit notoriously cautious, producer for EMI, makes a perceptive point. By the late 1920s, Chrysler was past his peak, and he knew it. In such a big, demanding work, would he want his runs so exposed for perpetuity? This is borne out if you compare his early electric recordings of Beethoven or Brahms or Mendelssohn with his 1930s remakes. In the later ones, the decline in technique and intonation is not hard to hear. So perhaps it's not such a disaster that Chrysler didn't record Elgar's concerto. What is disappointing and more puzzling is that he never recorded a note of Elgar's music. He made hundreds of recordings, many salon pieces, including his own Ek Viennese suite pieces. In recital, Chrysler frequently played Salud Amour, known as the favourite of Fritz Chrysler, and La Capriccia's, but he never recorded them. But let's hear Chrysler tantalisingly in a composer with links and affinity to Vorjak, to Elgar, Antonin Vorjak. Here's his humoresque recorded in 1938 with Franz Rupp, just a flavour of Chrysler's endearing qualities.
Meanwhile, from 1915, the leading advocate of Elgar's concerto was the great English violinist, Albert Sammons. He played the concerto over a hundred times, frequently with the composer conducting. No one plays my concerto like Albert. He gets to the heart of the matter, Elgar said. Why then, with Chrysler not playing ball, did Sammons not record the concerto with Elgar? Simple answer to this, they were contracted to rival companies, Elgar to HMV, the gramophone company, Sammons to Columbia. This is still an issue today. Uh, v. de Frang wants to record the Elgar Violin Concerto with Merger. Um, Merger, what's her? She loves Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Gratitude. 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 Thank you, Richard. Richard Rogg says he did a series of evening classes to learn how to pronounce her name. Really? Yeah. <laughs> yes. yes. Gratitude. Thank you. Sorry yeah. about that. <laughs> Merga Gratia Tillar yeah, wants to record the concerto with the de Frang, but they're contracted to rival companies, alas. I look forward, by the way, to going to Symphony Hall in Birmingham on the 8th of March when they're due to be playing Elgar's concerto together. By the time, but come back to the 1930s, by the time that Columbia and HMV had amalgamated to form EMI in 1931, Sammons had already made the first complete recording of the concerto with Sir Henry Wood conducting the Queen's Hall Orchestra in the spring of 1929. Albert Sammons later told a pupil that he was dissatisfied with it. That's not unusual for artists to say that he's satisfied with the recording. But he said the rehearsals were inadequate and that Wood spent too much time on the tutties. There is a brusqueness in some of Wood's conducting and they're not always completely together. Sadly, by the 1940s, Sammons had developed Parkinson's. At last, he joked, I have a perfect vibrato. <laughs> but he continued playing Elgar's demanding concerto. Now, one of his most eminent pupils was Hugh Bean, who went to Salmon's home for a lesson in 1945, 1949, I beg your pardon. And Hugh Bean was amazed as he entered the hall, who should be leaving but none other than Yasha Heifetz, the great virtuoso violinist. Heifetz had come to Salmon's in preparation for his recording of the Elgar Concerto with the LSO and Malcolm Sargent. Now, Heifetz was not noted for his generosity towards colleagues, but he paid Salmons an enormous tribute. He said, I'm only doing this, Albert, because you refused. Salmons' final performance of Elgar's Concerto was in the late 1940s with the BBC Northern Orchestra conducted by George Hurst, and it was broadcast, and by this time we have uh, uh, um, tapes recordings have come in so that it could well have been preserved and it was but alas it was wiped for a boxing match <laughs> still uh, um, Salmons was obviously past his prime at that point and there is a, a delightful recording of him playing Salut de Moor on this wonderful disc of Elgar Rediscovered. If you don't know this, it, it's got some absolute gems on it. We, we'll be coming back to that later. So back to the earlier period. Whilst recognising the authority of Salmon's performance and recording, Fred Geisberg was still intent to have a recording of the work with Elgar conducting. And of course, his famous brainwave was to bring together the 15-year-old Wunderkind Yehudi Menuhin with the senior composer. The rest, they say, is history. The 1932 Menuhin Elgar recording is rapturously beautiful, has an immediacy with, I think, with which the teenagers express emotions. And I love the verve of Elgar's enthusiastic conducting in the, in the tutties. Neville Cardus wrote of Menuhin's ear-catching, sensuous tone. It's certainly a rewarding compensation, which we would certainly not have had if Chrysler had made the recording of the concerto with Elgar. Now, Elgarians divide between their affinities between Salmons or Menuhin. I cherish both, 
and I'm very grateful to have both, but cards on the table, if I had to choose one, despite reservation about Woods conducting, it would be Albert Salmons at his mature peak in 1929. He has such a wonderful grasp of the big work. The tone is rich, the phrasing is natural, his portamenti are idiomatic, and he catches the personal, confiding qualities as well as the more public ones in this great work. As Ian Burnside well put it on Radio 3's Building a Library some years ago, Salmons wears his heart on his sleeve and keeps his waistcoat buttoned up. So before tea, let's hear the longest excerpt we're going to hear this afternoon, about seven minutes. Salmons with wood conducting in the haunting accompanied cadenza and brilliant coda of the violin concerto.
turn in this second half to think about conductors really will approach the subject of Elgar recordings that could have been made, should have been made but weren't for, through the lens of conductors. And we start with international conductors who were also great composers. And before the Great War, Elgar's music was championed by a number of these. What wouldn't we give to hear Mahler conduct the Enigma Variations, as he did in New York several times? He was due to conduct the first symphony, but then he died quite young, didn't he, in 1911. And it was conducted there by Walter Damrosch. Then there's Richard Strauss, who gave the German premiere of Cocaine in 1902. And a correspondence between Strauss and Elgar survives, with Elgar specifying Tempe in response to <coughs> queries which Strauss has raised. Later, famously, of course, at the German premiere of Gerontius, Strauss declared Elgar a Meister, and Elgar was ten foot tall. Unlike Elgar, Strauss was a professional, distinguished conductor of other people's music, and he made some recordings which are fascinating to hear today. On Desert Island Discs, Sir Adrian Bolt chose Strauss conducting Mozart's G minor symphony above anything else. That was the thing he said he'd take to a desert island before any other recording. And he has a lovely reminiscence of a performance conducted by Strauss in London before the Great War, when the, uh, the, they played a couple of, about three, I think, of Strauss's own tone poems and the Mozart G minor symphony. 
Strauss spent 40 minutes rehearsing his own music and five hours rehearsing the Mozart. Well, around 1960, there was a rumour circulating that Richard Strauss had recorded Elgar's variations. Wow, what a prospect. I've tried to research this, but so far in vain. Books and Mr Google have produced no results other than noting an execrable recording by a German radio orchestra with a conductor named on the label as Otto Strauss, quite possibly a pseudonym anyway. It was one of those dubious labels of LPs that were sold in Woolworths in the 60s at very cheap prices, if you, your memory goes back that far. Maybe this Otto Strauss had been confused in someone's mind with Richard? I don't know. But I do know this. 30 years ago, a CD magazine had a cover disc claiming to be by Chopin playing his own music. As, <laughs> as Chopin died in 1849, long before recordings were invented, and the month was April, it's obvious what was going on. Maybe it was something like that with Strauss and the variations too. There we are. Now, who wrote this? Elgar's Second Symphony. Dreadful, novel menti simplici. I came out after the third movement. So bored! Oh, or, after the first symphony, I'm absolutely incapable of enjoying Elgar for more than two minutes. I swear that only in imperialist England could such a work be tolerated. Who said that? Britain. Britain, yes, thank you, Michael. <laughs> yes, Britain, Benjamin Britain. That's the precocious teenager, Benjamin Britten, in his letters. Thankfully, however, in maturity, Britain changed his mind towards Elgar. This was partly through the close working relationship and friendship Britain had with the Decca producer, John Colshaw, which resulted in a remarkable discography of records of Britain conducting his own works, parallel to the earlier generation, the relationship between Geisberg and Elgar. So in the 60s, Britain came to terms with Elgar, appreciating him fully, more fully. And according to Colshaw, he was drawn to conduct the first symphony, which never happened. Anyway, in 1969, Britain was due to conduct For the Fallen from Elgar's Spirit of England at the new acoustically superb concert hall, the Snake Maltings. Britain wrote in a programme note, For the Fallen has always seemed to me to have in its opening bars a personal tenderness and grief. In the grotesque march, an agony of distortion, and in the final sequences, a ring of genuine splendour. Doesn't that put it well? Had the performance happened, it would almost certainly have been broadcast and preserved for posterity, as all festival performances usually were. Alas, a catastrophic fire destroyed the Snape Maltings, which had only opened two years previously. The concert was transferred to the glorious church at Blytheborough, and if any of you are interested in church architecture, Blytheborough is a must. It's on an escarpment um, in, in East Sussex, Suffolk, East Suffolk, <laughs> get it right. Uh, now, um, for, alas, though, there was no room in the church for the large forces required for the spirit of England, and the programme was changed. What might have been? Imagine For the Fallen from the composer of the War Requiem. But isn't it good that the spirit of England is being played and recognised as a great lamenting war elegy these days. It's coming, coming in from the cold, I feel, and that's very heartening. What we do have under Britain's conducting are two superlatively engineered Decca recordings. One is a highly dramatic Grontius, with a, which has fascinating composer's insight. Britain's rubato in Praise to the Holiest is almost identical to Elgar on the old 1927 records. And no, Britain hadn't heard them because they hadn't come to light then. It's in composer's intuition. The other Elgar work Britain recorded was the introduction in Allegro. He admired the boldness and originality of Elgar's string writing. Here's the recording with the English Chamber Orchestra, a performance of great verve and lyricism, with the, the opening pages, and note the haunting viola playing of Cecil Aronowitz. <laughs> Thank you. 
So, sorry about fading that. But time, we, we ought to move on. Thinking of Britain, I recall his sometime friend and fellow pacifist composer, Michael Tippett. Now, on Tippett's 80th birthday, the, in 1985, the BBC's long-running television omnibus did a programme on Tippett, which include, concluded him conducting the introduction of Allegro here at Malvern with the English Symphony Orchestra and Lindsay Quartet, and making interesting remarks about it. In his younger days, Tippett had been an admired conductor, but by that time he seems to have had more enthusiasm than clarity. It was good to see at the time, and it would be good to see again, though I, I can't find it on YouTube. Was anyone there at Tippett's 80th birthday in here at Malvern when he conducted the introduction of Legro? No. Was it in Sorry? Was it in no, I, I think it was in the hall in the town. <laughs> in the theatre. Mm. I, I, I think so. I no, okay. <laughs> by the way, this is an aside. The recent biography of Michael Tippett by Oliver Soden is an amazingly good r read on his life and times, though I'm a bit uneven on the music. I mentioned the Lindsay Quartet played in, the string quartet played then, and I recall several really memorable performances by them of the Elgar String Quartet, so penetrating and tender. But alas, they never recorded it, and I, I do hope that one day one of their broadcasts will be issued. Likewise, um, did it, was anyone present on the one occasion when the very great English pianist, Sir Clifford Curzon, played Elgar's piano quintet here in it's the only time he played the work, after intense research. But he was extremely high, highly strung and refused to have microphones present and was often accident prone if they were. But I, I just wondered if anyone had memories of that. A long time ago, it would be the early 80s, I think. Does it ring a bell? It could well have been the concert club. It was with the Medici String Quartet. Yeah. yeah. Did you recall anything about it? Oh, it's a long time it ago. It is a long time ago, yes. Sir. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Michael Messenger will know. Oh, right. Okay. Thank you, Stuart. Yeah. Let's, let's contact Michael about that. Mm. The thinking of other composers who had who, who um, conducted Elgar, albeit occasionally. One was Andrei Panufnik, who fled to the UK from savage persecution in Poland by the communists in 1954. He became conductor of the City of Birmingham Orchestra, as it was then, and really fell for British music. He especially loved Elgar's tribute to Poland, Polonia, calling it, rightly, a sombre and noble work, most evocatively echoing the heroic and tragic elements of Polish history. Panufnik conducted it five times during his Birmingham tenure and even wrote a work of his own with the same title in tribute to the Elgar. John Knowles' invaluable discography of Elgar's music led me to a 1978 broadcast of Polonia with the BBC National Symphony Orchestra and it was briefly available on CD coupled with the violin concerto but sadly I haven't been able to locate a copy so we can't, we can't hear that today. One of these days it'll turn up in Oxfam or something. <laughs> anyway, about 30 years ago, I recall my ears pricking up when the composer-conductor Oliver Nusson spoke of Falstaff on TV as Elgar's finest symphony before conducting a fine performance of the work. It was a work that Oliver Nusson had loved since boyhood. His father was an LSO player and had several, not the whole thing, but just several of the 78s of Elgar's recording. Nusson was due to conduct Falstaff at the Barbican with the BBC Symphony Orchestra in about 2016, and I was really looking forward to it, had to tick it. Had he done so, it would have been preserved for posterity. Alas, it's another, only what might have been. Due to Nusson's illness, the concert was cancelled, and, and they couldn't find a replacement. There was going to be a world premiere, I think, of a new work.
But I think it says something for the neglect of Falstaff that they couldn't find a replacement to, to conduct it on that occasion. Nusson, however, had conducted Elgar's symphonic study with the CBSO at Symphony Hall in 2009, and it was well received, critics praising its detail, sensitivity, and lack of sentimentality. Afterwards, apparently, Nusson held the score aloft to audience in a gesture of admiration. I remember Vernon Hadley doing that after he conducted Elgar, the, some of Elgar's rare oratorios. It's a, it's a lovely thing, isn't it, when conductors say, the composer that matters, the composer that matters. Sorry, Chris, did you? Yeah. So, so, sorry. Yeah. I did catch an all too rare live performance of Falstaff at the Festival Hall in London in 2019. Andrew Neil from our society is on the London Philharmonic's board and encouraged their inspirational conductor, Vladimir Yarovsky, to, to investigate Falstaff. And that was a really exciting performance, incisive in detail, of that astonishingly multi layered score. Now, verve and clear-eyed nostalgia. I noticed microphones present, um, and later I phoned up at LPO Live, their record label, and said, you know, are you going to issue this? And they said, no, they had no plans to do so. Still, here's hoping. Returning to an earlier generation of conductors, let's mention Mahler's pupils, Bruno Walter and Otto Klemperer, both of whom occasionally conducted Elgar, but didn't record him. Bruno Walter was greatly esteemed by Elgar, but in his autobiographical memoir, Walter says he was not very strongly attracted to Elgar's symphonies, but liked other works, and was deeply affected by the dream of Grontius, and, this is interesting, the composer's serious and sincere personality. Walter, in, um, performing with the BBC Symphony Orchestra in the 1930s, gave a number of concerts of Elgar's music, certainly one of the symphonies, and some of those concerts were recorded, but not, alas, the Elgar. As for Otto Klemperer, he first conducted Elgar when he was in exile from Hitler in Los Angeles in the 30s. And he, re he, he really admired the variations. He was due to conduct it with the Philharmonia Orchestra in 1951, but in a very his obstinate way, he refused. He says, no, I'm going to conduct Mozart's Jupiter Symphony. But everyone's expecting you to conduct Elgar. No, I'm conducting the Jupiter Symphony. Well, that Jupiter Symphony performance was the stuff of legends. And the great violinist, Mary Wilson, a real stalwart of London orchestras for many a generation, came up to Walter Legg, who owned the Philharmonia afterwards, and said, I feel such a bitch taking money from you for, for, for playing like that. Klemper was given appointment with the Philharmonia Orchestra. The rest, they say, is, is history. Um, it would be fascinating to hear him conduct the variations, but maybe it's no great loss that we haven't had that. Maybe other repertoire um, suited him better. We were, some of us were talking in the interval about Klemper's Beethoven recordings, for example. Well... Let's turn back to this country, to Sir Thomas Beecham, undoubtedly a conductor of genius, and no conductor did more for orchestral music or opera in the UK in the first half of the 20th century. It's larger than life, but complex character was certainly no died in the wall Elgarian. As is well known, when the first symphony was a great success, Beecham seized on it and conducted it no less than 22 times. But each time he conducted it, he made more and more cuts, much to the chagrin of the composer and critics at the time. Then, when Elgar suggested that Falstaff might have been written for Beecham, Thomas Beecham was ill-mannered and he refused to have anything to do with it. When the Elgars met Beecham at a lunch party in 1915, Elgar wrote in her diary of Thomas Beecham, very phantasmagorical and not appealing to us at all. <laughs> it must be said, however, that the working relationship between Elgar and Thomas Beecham was more interesting and complex than is usually recognised. I think that could be the subject of another talk, actually. And after World War II, Beecham played Elgar more frequently. Most of the major orchestral works, as well as, I think, some of the salon pieces and he made some Elgar recordings. 
Now, the great clarinetist Jack Breimer owed his career break to Beecham, and he was the principal clarinet in the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra. Jack Breimer wrote in an interview that Beecham's recordings do not do justice to his performances. Because, and that he put that down partly to Beecham's practice in the 50s of just, when he recorded for Phillips, of just re recording in short sections, sometimes uh, years apart. And the record performances were put together by the engineers, almost as the mood took him. Beecham relied heavily on assistants, engineers and librarians. Some of the live performances that have now emerged um, are, are absolutely stupendous. I mean, I think of a terrific Sibelius Second Symphony from the Festival Hall in 1954 with the BBC Symphony Orchestra. But with this practice that Breimer relates of Beecham just recording sections, he actually recorded two extended sections of Falstaff, but the record was never completed. What we do have from um, Beecham, and it fits quite neatly onto one CD, is an exquisitely phrased serenade for strings, a swaggering cocaine, and an enigma variation which is quite eccentric in some ways, but it grows on me each time I hear it. Beecham had that knack of hiring the best players and letting them play with a detailed marking of their parts, and he had a very special gift for phrasing. Beecham called Elgar's variations salon music, but he called it a pretty piece. A bit condescending, isn't it? But listen now to Jack Brimer playing the Romancer from the 13th variation. And the tension here suggests to me that Beecham knew something of the personal memories which surely lie beneath this music.
struck again hearing it how <laughs> amazing it is that uh, Brimer's control of sustaining those his, his tone in the pianissimo playing really outstanding clarinetist. One of Beecham's assistants was Norman Del Mar, a committed Elgarian who made some good Elgar records. One is the Enigma Variations with the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra recorded in Guildford Cathedral. This came out as a, on a bargain LP for the princely sum of 79 pence in 1975. Now I grew up near Guildford on a Saturday afternoon I would trawl around record shops, remember them? And which were full of this LP. You can imagine huge displays of them everywhere. Del Mar recorded in long takes and his vivid performance in the resonant cathedral acoustic has a great sort of emotional tug. It's, it's one of my favourites, although not my very favourite, which incidentally would be the LSO and Pierre Monteur, but that's another story. Anyway, the record sold very well because a year or two later it was reissued at double the price. <laughs> In an interview, Del Mar said this would be followed up by a recording of the Second Symphony. Alas, that never happened. Had it done so, it could well have introduced youngsters like myself at the time into that, 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 that symphony. But let's hear Del Mar conducting the much-missed Bournemouth Symphonietta now in a fine performance of the lullaby from the Bavarian dances with the Bournemouth Symphony Chorus. While in Bournemouth, we must mention the charismatic Romanian conductor, Constantin Silvestri. In 1961, he was appointed permanent conductor of the Bournemouth Symphony Orchestra, lured by an outstanding five-star French restaurant and fishing in the River Stour. BSO players have told me what a great partnership this was. Silvestri worked them hard, but was truly inspirational, and standards rose and rose. 
1967, they made what is arguably one of the all-time great El Elgar recordings. It's of In the South, which was then something of a rarity. Now, it almost never happened. Vaughan Williams' Talis Fantasia had been recorded in the extremely resonant acoustic of Winchester Cathedral. And that, by the way, is a marvellous, passionate performance uh, and music conceived for a cathedral. But the engineers couldn't record in the south to their satisfaction in that acoustic. So they thought about dropping it. Then thankfully, someone had the idea of transferring to Southampton Guildhall. The record was made and in the south gained greater recognition. Furthermore, the disc was successful, sold well, and a follow-up was planned, with Silvestri booked to record the first symphony. Alas, days before the sessions, he died of a heart attack, aged 55. From a private recording, there is, we do have now the first symphony, which came out on BBC Legends, but it, it is, though, I, I find disappointingly constricted both as a performance and in sound. Nevertheless, let's just have a brief sample of the opening of In the South. Sweeps you along, doesn't it? Istvan Kurtej was another conductor who died far too young in a drowning accident in 1973. Not associated at all with Elgar, I was recently amazed to read in a CD booklet by the Decca producer Ray Minsel that Kurtej had been scheduled to record Elgar's first symphony with the LSO, of which he was principal conductor, in February 1963. The night before the first session, Minsel heard them play Vorjak's Eighth, and he suggested to Kurtej that, instead of Elgar I, they should record the Vorjak. Decker agreed, and over the next decade, a Vorjak style cycle, still admired by many people, was the result. Minsel states that he had, quote, very considerable reservations about the Elgar. I wonder what these were. The commercial prospects of a recording in 1963, perhaps, or whether Minsel thinking, sensing that Kurtage wasn't right for this composer. Certainly, he went on to record in the 70s to produce an Elgar series with the London Philharmonic and Schulte, which received a lot of acclaim at the time, and some people still regard very highly. But there's no doubt that during the era of stereo LPs, the most publicised celebrity conductor was Herbert von Karajan. The May 1972 issue of Gramophone magazine has Karajan with a chaplet around him. And in this chaplet are the heads of many great composers. The caption reads rather portentously underneath, the great interpreter. Who is conspicuous by his absence? Why? It's Elgar. Interestingly, in the same issue, Edward Greenfield, reviewing a recording of the variations from the Philadelphia Orchestra and Eugene Ormandy, expressed the hope that von Karajan would play and record Elgar. It was not to be. 
Carrie-Anne has been quoted when asked about Elgar, why play second-rate Brahms when I can play the real thing? Ouch. I've been unable to source that quote. It's not included in Richard Osborne's magisterial and exhaustive biography of Carrie-Anne. But what we do learn from that book is that during the 1970s, Carrie Anne asked EMI for Elgar scores. Was he wanting to explore a wider repertoire, perhaps? Tellingly, he returned all of them quite promptly, but kept the Second Symphony. Maybe he felt a greater affinity with that work, as he seems to have done with others. The, the, the symphonies written on that, that period in the end of the first decade of the 20th century, Marlowe 9 or Sibelius 4, for example. Carrier never prepared or conducted uh, uh, Elgar's symphonies. Happily, the present conductor of the Berlin Philharmonic, and isn't it great that Elgar's music is being performed in Germany again much more now, but the present conductor, the inspirational Kirill Petrenko, has conducted the Second Symphony, it's an early um, concert they gave together in 2009, and it's available from the Berliner Philharmonica um, website. It's marvellous. The spirit of delight comes rather less rarely than usual, and the oboist in the funeral march, Albert Meyer, is something else. Well... Carlo Maria Giolini was another conductor often berated by Algarians for not playing his music. This much-loved Italian conductor was a great favourite in the UK in the 60s and 70s with the Philharmonia Orchestra and Chorus. Former members of the Philharmonia Chorus, a neighbour of mine in, in Winchester, used to talk in glowing terms of, and, and others as well I've met, a great affection of, towards Giolini. Now, in an interview in 1971, Giolini spoke warmly of the prospect of recording Garantius and that he was due to, that he was drawn to conduct, guess what, Falstaff. But alas, nothing came of it. Giolini never played or recorded any Elgar. As he grew older, his repertoire became more limited. The absence of Garantius from Giolini is, I suggest, a real loss. Given the quality of the Philharmonia Chorus, Giolini's devout Roman Catholic faith, and particularly their legendary performances of Verdi's Requiem, a work which Elgar said he adored, and which audibly influenced Garantius. So here's the Sanctus from the Verdi Requiem in a live Royal Albert Hall performance.
For those of us of a certain age, the name of David Munro will always be held in affection, not least for his boundary-crossing Radio 3 series in the early 70s, Pied Piper. At the forefront of the rediscovery of early music, David Munro, a recorder player, made over 50 recordings in a very brief period of instrumental reconstructions of music from earlier centuries, in particular historic settings. David Munro lived and worked in the fast lane. In a 1974 interview, Munro said, I'm almost a fanatic about Elgar. If I ever did conduct, I would love to have a, to, a go at Falstaff, his supreme achievement in construction. That was not to be. In 1976, in painful grief following the deaths of his beloved father and father-in-law in quick succession, David Munro tragically took his own life. Well, it's time, high time to round things off. We can mention now two Elgar performances which almost never happened or were saved from oblivion. Now, Michael Kennedy took years to persuade his friend John Barbaroli to take up in the South. And that most passionate of Elgar conductors, a very thorough worker, finally performed it with the Halle in Manchester and in what turned out to be his final London concert with the Royal Philharmonic, the Royal Festival Hall with the Halle. Thankfully, BBC microphones were there, and it's a thrilling, ardent performance eventually issued on BBC Legends. But let's end with another performance which was nearly lost, but wasn't quite, and that is Elgar himself conducting his Elegy for Strings, that most concentrated of mourning pieces, as Robert Anderson puts it. This is the performance Elgar recorded at a late session with the BBC Symphony Orchestra on the 11th of April 1933, and it's on this song disc, Elgar Rediscovered. It sent, as ever, a test pressing after the sessions. Initially, Elgar seemed happy with the performance, but on the 23rd of August, we find Fred, Fred Geisberg noting that Elgar requests the elegy to be re-recorded. He suppressed this performance with the BBC Symphony Orchestra. Elgar did re-record the elegy with, in a session with the LPO. It turned out to be his last session on the 29th of August. And that was the one that was issued at the time and reissued over the decades. It is, I think, a somewhat tired performance from the ageing composer at the end of a long session. But then, a few years ago, Elgar's test pressing of the earlier BBC Symphony Orchestra performance was rediscovered, and thanks to the work and dedication of John Knowles, was finally issued on, on the Elgar Rediscovered CD. The BBC Symphony Orchestra performance, which we'll hear in a moment, has more of that elusive Elgarian fluidity and sounds much more felt than the later LPO one. So the question is, why did Elgar reject it? It could be, as has been suggested, misgivings about the string tone as recorded. Maybe that's what Elgar said. But I'm inclined to think the pangs of loss are so exposed here that Elgar felt it revealed just too much. <laughs> 